cycling, running and rowing are some sports that are perceived as white dominated. In Sports England's latest ethnicity poll, across all sports, 89% of participants have a white background and only 11% are from non-white backgrounds. Home responsibilities, lack of local facilities and money are among the reasons why people of black ethnicity don't take part in white dominated sports. But that doesn't stop everybody. I just wanted to just play darts. And it didn't matter whether, to be honest with you, whether it was a white or black background. We'd probably need to move thinking of them in such an, in an essentialist way, in terms of that is a white sport or that's a black sport. When I first started, it was more people more intrigued because they're not used to seeing black people playing. So it was the 90 moved to the US that I actually realised swimming is a white sport. I certainly think there's, there's a perception still um, that, there, that certain sports uh, might be, you know, white only. Darts, bowls and swimming are sports that are not common within the black community. Darts was a sport associated with the working class in the 1800s. It was the centre of pub culture. However, bowls were subjected to wealthy groups in the 13th century. It's now mainly associated as a recreational activity by the elderly. Swimming became an Olympic sport in the late 1800s, but it wasn't until 1976 that a black female was a medalist at the Olympics. People believe that sports is a way of uniting countries and cultures. It's one thing to bring people together, but it's another when there is an acceptance. I went to De Montfort University in Leicester to speak to Professor Matt Taylor to get an understanding of the exclusivity of some sports that prevent openness to others. Sports like, like, like rowing and, and those sorts of things where, where actually to be a member, to be, to be part of that particular world, which may not necessarily be defined in racial terms, but actually is about race as, as, as in the same way as it is about other things. I think that, 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 that that's another factor which has tended to keep, to, to, to make it unlikely that um, good black athletes will, 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 will go, go along that line and they might go to another sport. And there's also the issue of role models, you know, and all these things are interconnected. You know, if there aren't role models in a particular sport, you know, what would actually, um, convince someone to, to think that that's the, the best way to use my athletic talents and you know etc etc so I think there are, there are a number of things are combined and it's sometimes quite difficult to disentangle them Dita Hedman competes to defend her 2016 championship title at the 2017 Darts Welsh Open well, in the early days, as you know, there was always the racial tension anyway. Back in the early days when I used to play, sometimes I would be on the hockey playing whatever and someone would be behind me think, saying, oh, monkey can throw darts or God, I didn't know they train baboons. But it's all those kind of things that I would hear in the background and sometimes I would stop and just say, would you like to repeat that? and everybody would like, look, oh, it wasn't me. But to be honest, my friends, when I was playing, if they did hear somebody say anything on towards, then they would tackle them before I had a chance to get at them. So in that sense, I wouldn't class everybody as being racist. And even now, to this day, it's still there, but it's not in your face, but it is still there and I would challenge anybody who says it's not. Do you know, the more that they put me down, the more I'm in their face, the more it just, it's a challenge. 
because I will say, you say what you like and I will show you what I'm what, what I am. And that's it. And I think that's why I do so well because it's like everything. You always have to prove yourself, whichever, whatever thing you do. So it just spurs me on. And when I think, oh God, I'm getting fed up with this and somebody says something or someone makes a comment, then I just think, yes, I need that. Keep going. And I'll just keep going and in your face. Meanwhile, at the back of the council estate in Streatham, I play bowls and what I've been trying to do is um, get Jamaica officially recognised within the sport. So what I've done for that is just as much stuff as I can to sort of raise a pub the publicity and the promotion of Caribbean people playing lawn bowls because as you probably may or may not know, we're not known to play. To bring awareness to the sport, Andrew created his own merchandise. So I was playing around with names and stuff and I've got reggae rollers, so I thought we'll keep, we'll keep reggae rollers. That's sort of the stuff like that, woolly, woolly hats. Yeah, a couple of Australians on Facebook, oh stop advertising your stuff in here, blah, blah, blah. I've been abused by one particular person on Facebook, basically saying that I, I'm, I wasn't born in Jamaica, I shouldn't be looking to play for Jamaica sort of thing, and I'm a fraud. He, he's an American guy that does a bit of bowls for America, and you know, he's not important, but when you get these sort of things shooting out, you start thinking to yourself, you almost start second guessing yourself, but you know, it's just how it goes. Across. Yeah. So it's all about getting your line and your length. Dr. Paul Campbell at Coventry University, he provides insight on racial tension that some black athletes faced in white dominated sports. Black players also had to, in effect, accept is a strong word, but certainly turn a endure endure they certainly had to endure things like racist banter they had to endure what colin king uh, describes as sort of white working class practices things like sub subscribe to a very sort of strong drinking culture um and, and in effect a, a performance which was very much bound around white working class norms um black players that resisted that were seen as troublesome, were seen as uppity, were seen as having a chip on their shoulder, and invariably the problem was there. So if they were sort of raising questions about, if, if they were sort of saying to the manager, for example, um, that, that they were unhappy at the kinds of racial sledging they were getting, or that actually they were reacting to racial provocation on the pitch, so if somebody called them a, a racist name and they reacted, they were seen as the problem. It was them and they would be seen as the one that would have to be ejected, not that there was a problem within the game. Suleiman Tari, a Ghanaian footballer playing for Portsmouth, was held racial slurs at a football game in Italy. He was suspended from football after walking off the pitch in protest. NBA players wore I Can't Breathe t-shirts during pre-game warm-ups to bring awareness to police brutality in the United States. From my understanding, there are two sides to racism in sports. The side where athletes are racially abused and the side where they use their sport as a platform to overcome it. These sorts of things, you know, stem you know, go back quite a long way. And then if we kind of move, move to the, to the uh, 60s in, 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 you know, and these were things which were global in a way. You know, we might associate, of course, the civil rights movement with the US and, and, and you know, the general issues that were going on, which clearly had an impact, very clear uh, impact on, on, on what was happening in sport. 
um, uh, linked to you know very significant moments such as uh, 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 such as such as the Black Power salute at the, at the Olympics and things like this. I mean, those were very 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 significant key moments. But in many many other sports, these were kind of there were, there were tensions which were kind of running through the everyday, more of the everyday of sport. Under the world record, her own world record by almost half a second, Melia Tita, lane number four, Atkinson. Alia Atkinson, a two-time Olympian from St Andrew Parish, Jamaica, was the first black woman to earn a swimming world record in 2014. I do know that my coach, uh, which I was very lucky to have, so my coach when I migrated, um, Christopher Anderson, he, swims, he coaches South Florida Aquatics, and it was it was a good point in my life because I was I'm very introverted when I was younger. So my coach actually helped me come out on the scene when he saw me starting to, to race more international swimming. So he would kind of like prep me beforehand. So he would actually make jokes about me um, because the way he did it in a joking, loving way, when somebody else said it in a bad way, I'm like, Psh, my coach has said worse. Like, so he kind of um, deflected on me and, and, and made it seem like whatever anybody says about you, it's not true. Um, and I think because of that, and he always prepped me at a young age that, no, it's fine. Again, they're on the way. This will all be over in a little over 30 seconds. This is a time when you go to swim meets, you see like, oh, the Brazilians or the Americans or the Australians. But then you see a person of color, you say, oh, the black people. Um, so I think... It was hard for me to separate between that because the African nations were coming up and they were developing, which is great. But here on one side, you have me who is trying to, to, to build this wave for swimming for black people and they're now labeling, labeling me as a now a developmental swimmer. I'm like, no, you've seen me around. Don't just look at my color, find my name, know what events I do and what country I come from. Uh, I think that was the hardest part. Nobody looked at me, they just saw my color. I know for Jamaica, um, they don't really see the importance of swimming as a sport. And because they label it as a sport instead of a life skill, they realize that they don't need it. Instead of saying that this is something that you need to teach your child to do, water safety is very important. They label it as a sport and we don't have money for that extracurricular activity. Um, and a lot of people also say like you say both and Shelly and Fraser and how popular you can get in track. So of course you would you send your child to track. Um, and swimming also has a lot of financial difficulties more than any other sport because you have that suit, you have to have the training environment, you can't just get up and swim anywhere. Um, so financially, um, popularity in the media and, the, and in the areas. Um, but for black Americans, when I moved up, I realized it was a completely different scheme of things. It was more of, we can't swim because of our body type or we can't swim because we're going to mess up our hair. And it was shocking to me because I never understood that in Jamaica. Nobody, that wasn't the reason for Jamaica. It was more financially um, and how to better excel in a sport. But for up here, it was more of aesthetic looks. Um, so it was dif it was difficult for me to turn that. And people like Simone Manuel and Leah Neal from US, they got uh, medals in the past 2016 Olympics. And they're continually trying to change that stereotype. Um, like, yes, we can swim and look good too. <laughs> like... Um, if you want to do your hair, that's fine, but there's also a time and a place. You stopping to do a sport that you may or may not love or be great in it is greater than your hair do at the moment. It's awfully annoying when you have to compromise your hair to swim. This is coming amongst the black community to now. Swimmer Caps is a South African-based company that creates larger swimming caps for Afro hair. 
Not only have the caps become hugely popular in the eastern and southern regions of Africa, but it is gaining a global recognition. For me, it didn't make sense to not have a cap like this in Africa, in South Africa, where I mean, where most, in fact, the majority of people, they, they look like me, they have hair like mine, be it an afro and braids, um, weaves, uh, I mean, just our hair, it grows up. <laughs> so it didn't make sense that we, we didn't have a cap that can fit most of us. Numvuya shows different cap sizes, ranging from children to adults. This is mine. <laughs> She gives a demonstration of the cap's durability. This revolutionary idea is now paving a way for more black swimmers who have Afro hairstyles in the sport. That's, yeah, and it doesn't feel heavy. That is amazing. With athletes and professionals now paving a way to overcome the underrepresentation in sports, hope isn't lost. There's potentially, there's potentially hope to do that. Um, and I think it's, we're probably in a better position now than we were, you know, 15 or 20 years ago in that respect. What we need and what most sports have always needed is someone to trailblaze, someone to sort of make become that 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 sort of iconic person which others will follow.